start with first thank you Kenneth for inviting us and having us over here. Um, my name is Kenneth Wright. Um, I'm a systems engineer by background. Nowadays I'm also concerned with management stuff and strategic things. Um, so today we will talk about uh, OpenStack and HPC. And I promise you I didn't know what uh, Samia is going to tell you about this. Um, what, what I want to talk to you about is something that's really related to what he was previously um, presenting. And I also want to really say thank you all because you motivated the problem very well for me, so I can skip all of that. Um, so, the agenda for today, I will briefly give you a couple of general things, what I, some thoughts that I have on uh, what Damien said before. Uh, I will also briefly introduce to you who we are, what we're doing. Uh, what, the, what the people are doing that we work for. Um, and in my, my understanding from what I've seen from this audience today, I think a lot of you are systems engineers for HPC centers, right? So how many people here are systems engineers or system administrators? Okay, that's 50%, 40%, something like that. And how many of, of you guys already have something like OpenStack running or are looking into cloud stuff? So, yeah, 50% as well. Yeah, the topic is just important. I think you cannot really avoid it. Um, of course, I think all of you that are reading the open stack know that this is a very, very complex topic. And uh, the question is, how can you do something like that in something like half an hour? So we split the talk today in three parts. Um, I have the two colleagues of mine here with me, that's Eric and Dimit. Um, they're going to present to you stuff related to operational things like how do we deploy the cloud, how do we validate it, how do we do it's working, and of course we also put another topic relevant to systems administrators or systems engineering, uh, which is monitoring. There is going to talk about. In achievements is uh, Damien's last uh, slide. So basically what this talk is about, how we are building what he called the cloud server. On so who are we? We are part of the cloud platform engineering team at uh, the Vienna Bio Center. We work with three molecular biology research institutes. Um, they're mainly at too close. To too close. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, these two research institutes are doing basic research in molecular biology. So there's things like plant science, cancer biology, developmental biology, stuff like that. And uh, we're from the IT department, and we're tasked with delivering all of the IT stack for these research institutes. Um, all in all, we have roughly something like 40 research groups and have to support 500 scientists. And as mentioned before, we do everything from workstations, networking, HPC, you name it, we do it. Um, for HPC, um, and our department is 40 people in total. So, computing at the Vienna Biocenter, as I mentioned before, uh, we are mostly research institutes in molecular biology, so unlike I think most of you who are running university central computing systems, we only cater to basically bioinformatics, uh, which makes it a bit easier for us because we have a very similar crowd of support. Um, so applications that we're running That's good. Um, so the applications that we're running are very similar, and we can share with them across many, many users and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think all of you get the picture what it means to support uh, bioinformatics. Um, so these, these applications, they're not classical uh, HPC applications. We don't have many MPI workloads. Most of the stuff is single-threaded. Um, or even uh, multi-threaded applications. These are already the scalable uh, applications that we have. Yeah. And these apps mostly deal with processing, analyzing data, plotting it, stuff like this. And uh, what's specific to our place is that we have a lot of machinery that actually acquires the data. 
So we have microscopes that produce hundreds of terabytes of data per day, stuff like that. And um, because of historical reasons, we always had many uh, compute clusters to support this. So we have, of course, computing environments for batch computing, so running Slurm and things like that. And of course, we have uh, infrastructure for running stateful applications like uh, web stuff and databases. Um, so the way it currently looks for us, so we have this silos of an island of infrastructure. Um, and of course, you cannot easily use resources here, the gen here, from this other silo. Stuff is of course split out, so of course, for example, this might be a cluster running Slurm, this is a cluster running PBS Pro, and this is a cluster running SGE, this is a VMware farm, this is a Hyper-V farm, this is a small open stack. Um, and of course, this is, from an IT perspective, very difficult to manage and um, super hard to automate. And in addition to that, it's also horrible for our users because all of these systems are very heterogeneous. So what we want to gather is something like that. We would have physical compute resources, pool them, deploy OpenStack to manage these physical resources, and then carve out individual resources for things like our Jupyter, Hub, Spark, and of course we need to support uh, our Slurm uh, environment that our users are using. Is it better now? What we also want to have is, of course, not only st statically partition this, but being able to move the, the sliders around here. So if you see, okay, currently we would have more demand for Slurm, then of course it would make the Slurm cluster bigger, or more of our users are moving to using something like Jupyter, then of course it will need to assign more resources or something like that. Um, Sorry. Yeah, and uh, we set up a project within IT to deliver such um, cluster, Uber, HPC infrastructure. Um, and we chose OpenStack to do it because we didn't find really any alternatives to that. Um, so the, the CLIP project, as we call it, that stands for Cloud Infrastructure Project, um, its goal is to basically implement not only an infrastructure that we will use for HPC, but we also want to use it to implement it software-defined data center strategy. Because we quickly figured out that it would be really a waste of learning something like OpenStack and then only using it for HPC stuff, right? Because we have many other services in the data center as well that we need to support. If you have some things like R and they need to publish to the web, of course, we need load balancing, firewalling, all the other stuff. And we figured quickly out that OpenStack could be one platform that does all of these things. And uh, since OpenStack is really a big monster and a big beast, we decided to split this project into several phases. So first, we were mostly building a proof of concept, and uh, that served as a demonstration, exploration, and discovery environment. Um, that took us roughly two months, so getting a first picture of how ugly is the beast really, and is it viable to continue this project. Um, what we did afterwards is, after we concluded it actually is feasible and viable, and this is exactly what we want to have, um, we start the actual task of getting to know the stack really good. So most of the work was geared towards integrating what we already have in, in our data center into the OpenStack services. And of course, we needed to figure out some kind of architecture, how all of this stuff would work together. Um, as part of this, we also <coughs> need to develop a deployment system, for example, um, what's, what we had to do is, I think we basically reinstalled OpenStack something like five to six hundred times in a year. So we really needed to come up with a system how to automatically do this. Um, after we had our first look into OpenStack, it was clear, quickly clear that this thing doesn't have any built-in monitoring system. But you can't build a system like that without having monitoring. So we spent a lot of time coming up with a deployment system to monitor it. So this is the two things that uh, these two young people uh, <laughs> 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 talked about. Um, yeah, and that took us roughly something like eight months. But this is like concentrated effort from four people who already have um, a very good background in, in this kind of technologies. So what where we're currently at is the deployment of the production cloud system. So we've been doing this now for the last two months, and uh, what it is part of that is, of course, purchase the system, install the hardware, wrap it up, etc., etc. And uh, 
once we get back to the office, what we're going to start doing is actually deploying the payload on top of OpenStack. So the boxes I've shown before, so we're going to start now deploying stuff like Slurp stuff, things like that. So how does the cloud look like for us? And it's really curious why this has such a low resolution. Um, so basically what we did and what Damien also said is, and what is I think the key for the cloud system is that you have a heterogeneous set of nodes. And what we decided to pick is that we're going to have four types, even though it's a big chunk, it shows three different, uh, four different types. So there we have five types. So we have compute nodes, which just basically provide compute cores to the cloud. And we have them in two types, so very high clock uh, and low amount of cores and very high amount of cores and low amount of clock. Then from machines that have a lot of memory and that's, I mean, terabyte size and more, we have also two different types. Then we have machines that have a ton of uh, NVMe SSD flash that they provide to the cloud. And of course, we have nodes that accelerate it, so we have four to eight GPUs in there. And this is tied together by a 100 gigabit RDMA capable software defined network that also, of course, has our existing IP storage systems plug in, stuff like that. And uh, here in parallel to this whole picture, you also see some nodes that are responsible for actually uh, implementing the control functions of the cloud. Um, so the first phase of this deployment has roughly 100 compute nodes. Um, in total, this is around 3,500 Skylake cores, I think 24 terabytes of RAM. DIO nodes have multiple 100 gigabit ports, and in total we have something like 250 terabyte usable uh, NVMe. And uh, if you provision a BGFS file system on these IO nodes, you get something like 200 gigabyte per second uh, reads. Because this is also an HPC uh, talk, I wanted to give you just a very brief, uh, just briefly scheme what we did to make this actually really an HPC setup. So when you start with OpenStack out of the box and you're really just thinking in terms of VMs, of course your performance is not going to be really nice. But there are good checklists out there on the things that you have to do to actually do uh, get good performance. So of course you need to deal with things like NUMA. How are, you going in, how are your instances going to look like? What kind of geometry? Do you want them to actually share memory controllers or not? There are, of course, limitations here and the levels and the details. So if you actually really want to be NUMA clean, you cannot access all your I.O. devices, depending on the NUMA topology of the machine. You have to think about how do you deal with huge pages? Do you turn on same page merging or not? Do you reserve, um, do you run your instances only in huge pages? That, for example, you can use this as an isolation mechanism from the host. Do you do core isolation? Because if you're running an OpenStack compute node, if you look at it, this was run something like 10 Docker containers. There are around 15 to 1600 RPMs installed on this. And just the booted up host not running anything will consume on the order, or I think in our setup is like that, something like 7 to 8 gigabytes uh, of RAM. Um, what is, of course, very crucial in this setup is PCIe pass through. So for your GPUs and NVMEs, if you want to use something like VMs, that's definitely something you have to use. And as usual, SRIOD. So passing through network devices and or GPUs and uh, VMs. Um, so lessons learned. So OpenStack really is incredibly complex. So it took us <coughs> uh, the better part of a year to get at a say, medium level of expertise with it. Um, it really is a monster. Um, and it's not a product. So what OpenStack is, is a framework for building clouds. And there's no two clouds that look alike. Um, what we also understood from, from our painful experience is that you at least need two or three of those environments because the upgrades are really, really complex. So what we're doing is we're using is Redwood's OpenStack platform and that uses a project called Triple O. So basically what you do is you deploy a very small OpenStack that you're going to use to deploy the actual your actual OpenStack installation. So you have something called the Undercloud that's running a basically fully fledged OpenStack that deploys your actual OpenStack. Um, and the, the Triple O project is something like, I would say, 200,000 lines of YAML, uh, plus this is Ansible, this is Puppet, it's containerized. <coughs> Any piece of technology you can find, it actually uses all of this. So you have your Zookeeper running, you have etcd running, you have a pacemaker cluster running to keep your database alive and your services alive. You have a queuing system, all of that. Um, and you need to really be good at troubleshooting in all the layers of the stack to make 
upgrades really worth uh, really functioning. And so what we basically do is we have three open stacks and we first try the upgrade on the smallest environment, then we see how that works out, then we do it on the second environment until it hopefully have all the issues ironed out until it gets into the production environment. Um, another thing that we also learned is that the out-of-the-box experience from all these software-defined components is really, really bad. So if you, for example, looking at standard networking stuff from OpenStack, this won't get you far. It's not scalable, it does everything in software, the forwarding will be horrible. Um, and this is one of the things we definitely have to use on hardware appliances that can offload all these operations properly. Um, the other thing that we've also learned is that cloud network is really, really hard. Um, it's really complex, and um, everything that you ever learned about networking, you have to relearn this again to, in order to be able to successfully support an open stack installation. In our case, it's also a bit more complicated because we already had a hardware SDN before in the data center and had to integrate that. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll hand over to Mitt now, and he will talk about deployment and cloud verification. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I guess everyone can hear me, right, from the microphone. Okay, great. So uh, I will talk a bit about the um, uh, deployment and cloud verification, because that's also a crucial part. Um, and I think Peter talked about, about this. Uh, we decided to go for Red Hat OpenStack because we had existing licenses. Um, and um, Red Hat OpenStack uses this triple O upstream project, which stands for OpenStack on OpenStack. So basically, it consists of two parts. You have the undercloud, where you, which is a single node installation of OpenStack. And you can see some of the components here, OpenStack components. And with those components, you actually deploy the, the overcloud. That's, the, that's seen here on the right side. Uh, and that's the cloud where you will run your payload. And you can see there are a lot of those services uh, on this, like, they are in the undercloud and also in the, in the overcloud. Um, and according to the Triple O project, basically the main benefit, among others, is that that when you learn kind of the maybe not it's better. Sorry. <laughs> yes. um, so basically, when you learn, uh, when you invest time as an operator to learn um, this installer, you will also get a lot of knowledge about the OpenStack components, which will benefit you once you run your overcloud. Um, and by default, uh, the, 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 uh, the triple O gives you an HA setup of the overcloud. And there are two ways how to install the overcloud. You can either go through a web GUI, um, or you go directly, also exclusively through the CLI, um, using or customizing YAML files. We were new to this triple uh, O project, so we decided to try out the GUI. And it's actually pretty nice and handy. You get validations if you made some mistakes, you can assign and the roles to, um, to various nodes you have in your cloud, for example, controller nodes, uh, object storage nodes, compute hy hypervisor nodes. Um, you can customize kind of the, the settings uh, under the hood. It will customize the YAML files, uh, and you can deploy it. And this was nice and handy, but uh, we somehow figured out that this is not very um, this is not a very good approach if you want to have reproducible deployments and especially fast iteration because we, as Peter mentioned, we deployed many, many times. Um, we decided that's not a scalable approach. So we just disabled the web, web UI and decided to do it exclusively from the CLI. Um, but we, we, did, we didn't only want to run kind of this code as, uh, infra as code uh, just for the OpenStack deployment. We wanted to have the end-to-end uh, kind of deployment, all the network preparation, uh, storage integration, we wanted to have this all in code so uh, that we can reproducible deploy. Uh, and we, 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 we had to decide on a config management tool and we didn't have many preferences, but eventually we settled on Ansible because it was the easiest one to use for us. Um, interestingly, uh, Triple O itself uses, um, uses Heat, this is an OpenStack orchestration engine, that drives Puppet on the nodes, which in turn drives Ansible to configure the nodes. So you can clearly see this is already quite complex, and I will talk a bit about this complexity a bit later in the next slides. Um, so we basically used Ansible to drive the triple O deployment um, and some additional tasks that are needed before and after the deployment. And basically the deployment is split up in four phases, which correspond roughly to four different Git repos. 
Um, we have this clip undercloud prepare repo. This is a set of Ansible playbooks that run on a Bastion <coughs> VM, which is connected to those free underclouds, the, the, the underclouds of the free environments, and which um, which main job is to uh, prepare and install install the undercloud using Pixie and Kickstart. Then we have the clip triple O repo. This is, contains all the YAML, the triple O YAML customizations for our free environments. So which IP addresses we use. What's the storage uh, integration, uh, the network configuration, and so on. And then we have the Clip Bootstrap repo, that is also a set of um, Ansible playbooks for operations like backup, disaster recovery. Um, but main, the main job is actually to use the Clip Triple O repository and deploy the overcloud, and then do some post uh, post tasks like generate the Ansible inventory for post customizations. And finally, we have the Clip OS infra. Con a repo that contains <coughs> Ansible playbooks for post customizations, specifically for things that are not exposed in Triple O. So Triple O have a set of common hooks and common configuration <coughs> variables you can tune, but some of them um, it is very hard actually to do them through Triple O. And some of the services, for example, we use Designate as a service, which is which is not supported out of the box by Red Hat. For example, for those kind of things, we use this clip OS infra um, playbook. Um, so the, the big downside of Triple O, and I want to be honest about this, is that it's quite slow, because it uses Heat, the orchestration engine, to run Puppet and then eventually Ansible. That means if you have a single change in the config stanza and you want to restart the service, you would have to do a so-called stack update. So everyone who knows OpenStack and Heat, that's basically the overcloud is a stack. And the stack update um, will run Puppet on the nodes, and then we'll run Ansible, and even if nothing changes, it will take 20 minutes uh, for a sim simple change. So obviously with Ansible, it, this would be much faster. So initially we thought, well, we just use Triple O to get the bare minimum overclouds deployed, and then you put all the customization in this clip OS infra and just do it for Ansible, right? Because that's much faster to iterate. Um, unfortunately, we figured out that Every stack update, and you would need a stack update once you want to scale up or scale down the nodes, or you want to just update the, the software packages, will overwrite, so Puppet will overwrite our Ansible modified files. And this will, in turn, cause some services like storage integration to fail. Of course, we could run afterwards the clip OS infra to fix this, but this was not something which we were comfortable to do with. So we decided to compromise. Um, we decided to continue using Ansible to iterate, and different customization, um, customizations and try them out. And, but once we finalized or, or, or settled on some of the customizations, we moved them back to triple O and so that every stack update will keep them. But for everything else, we decided to keep Ansible. For example, we have a clip ACI infra repo that is used uh, to prepare the SDN uh, fabric for those free environments. Um, or for example, we have another uh, repo for moving nodes between production uh, environment and uh, staging and depth so that we can actually create um, different size clusters in every of those environments. Um, so with the uh, InfraS code, we now have a reproducible deployment method that's pretty handy already for these three different environments. Um, but how can we guarantee that um, the how can we guarantee reproducibility of deployment regarding software updates? Because Red Hat, on a regular basis, releases software updates both for the OS base, base, image, uh, base packages, but also for the OpenStack services. And so you don't want, for example, to do a YAM update on one of the environments and suddenly you have a completely different uh, software, um, software versions on that, on that environment. So to make sure that we can pin those, we, um, we used uh, Red Hat Satellite, or uh, upstream is called Foreman, to create these lifecycle environments for those three different environments. And you can see them here. We have basically dev developments, uh, staging, and production. And then we also created content views for the base packages, as well as for the OpenStack services and containers. And so we can easily, unfortunately, you can see that well, but you can, you can basically, this is a content view for the OpenStack packages, and we can version them and roll them over from development to do staging to production. So this makes kind of the software versions, um, uh, make sure that the software versions are pinned. Um, 
while working with the deployments, we also running uh, various OpenStack issues, like kind of bugs, known bugs that were either fixed in newer versions of OpenStack or in Red Hat. Um, and so, to, for some of them, we had to come up with workarounds. Um, and to keep track of all those workarounds and open bugs, um, um, we basically used Gyro. We created a Gyro project that we called um, Clip Release Engineering. Um, and whenever we run into a bug, we will document, we will create a ticket, then we will investigate why this bug happens, what's the effect of the bug. We will um, we'll basically sit together, we review all together the, the bug and then decide if we want to do a workaround or we want to create a ticket with Red Hat or wait for the, for the patched software package to be released. Uh, and then it goes either in waiting, for, for example, support ticket or workaround, um, and eventually when the software um, package, the patch software package is released, we will undo the workaround and then move the ticket to done. This helps us keep actually track of all, all, of, of, all of these things. Um, so one very important crucial thing is uh, how to handle day two operations. So how can you make sure that your cloud is actually working? Because I mean, de deployment is one thing, but how can you make sure that they don't break? Um, so for that, we also didn't want to reinvent the wheel. What we decided to do is to use OpenStack's own testing uh, suit, it's called Tempest. Um, basically, every OpenStack project, like let's say the Glance uh, image service, <coughs> they come with their own test suite, uh, ranging from simple unit tests to API tests to scenario tests. So what we did is we created a Jenkins pipeline that runs every night on all the free environments, and first runs um, so-called smoke tests. These are tests that make sure that the basic cloud functionality is there. There's around 128 tests that run in two to three minutes. And once this test suit is successfully um, finished, we will trigger uh, the full test run, which will test everything, basically. These are 3,000 tests, ranging from storage, integration, to networking, everything you can think of, basically. And the nice thing is the Tempest uh, output is an X unit output, so we can pass this in Jenkins, and you can not only see that your cloud is broken, you can also see when this, the tests start to fail. And with Tempest, we found a couple of misconfigurations regarding storage integration, but we also figured that there was uh, an issue in our networking stack. Um, so making sure that the cloud works is actually one, uh, it's only one aspect. Um, so this is, sorry, this was um, actually also, this is how it looks like we have here 21 failed tests. Um, so making sure that the cloud works is nice, but what about performance? So how can you make sure that when you update OS packages or when you update um, OpenStack services or firmware, that the performance is still there, or there's no regression? And we, when we talk about performance, we actually mean two things. The most important one, of course, being the payload performance, because we will run a batch scheduling system on top of of OpenStack, so we, might, we have to test the payload or the data plane. Um, but because we also want to use the cloud as a dynamic resource, we also have to make sure that the control plane performance is there, right? Because we will spin up VMs, take, um, uh, destroy VMs and so on. And for that we again went to an OpenStack project called Browbeat. Um, that's basically wrap around different stress tests and benchmarking uh, tools um, that tests um, so specifically, we use Rally that uses that actually tests control plane performance, uh, Shaker for network stress tests, and PerfKit Benchmarker for doing payload tests, basically. Um, and we run them on a regular basis and also before and after updates. And on the right side, you can see kind of a static chart of a typical Rally test for authentication for the Keystone uh, API. And this is like not a very stressful test. And the nice thing is with Rally, you can define SLAs. For example, the average latency you <coughs> accept or how many tests or how many API calls should fail. And you can, you can see, well, with not that high concurrency, we'll pass all the SLAs. But when we start to increase the concurrency, we can see, we can see that some of the SLAs start to fail. Like for example, average late latency. Um, and if, if we increase it even more, you can see that we have even API calls that just, the backend just returns 500. So either there's a misconfiguration or we need... This was also done on a one controller setup. Um, but per, uh, Browbeat can do more than just individual tests. Uh, whenever you run a Browbeat run um, test, uh, it will go to your cloud, um, retrieve all the configurations. That means like the software versions of all the OS OpenStack packages, but also the configuration regarding number of workers for your 
Keystone API uh, workers, for example, and uh, store the results of the, of the stress test together with those meta information in Elasticsearch. And then you can do some cute things, like for example, you can compare two runs and see if a software update uh, introduced regression. So you, here you can see different API calls regarding um, the networking, and you can see there was a commit for commit hash. This was the latency, and for the second commit hash was this, and you can barely see the difference. Um, or you can also visualize it or aggregate it based on the number of uh, workers that were defined. So if you increase the number of workers, you can see that the latency is lower than if you have only one worker. And eventually you can even find bugs in your kind of network setup, for example, where, for example, the metadata service um, has a memory leak, apparently. Um, so I want to conclude basically this section with a couple of lessons learned and pitfalls. Um, some of them actually overlap with what Peter said. So OpenStack and Triple O are very complex um, software. Uh, is very complex software with many moving parts. Um, having a dev staging environment uh, to test upgrades, test configurations is, I think, essential. And also, not underestimate somehow having a way to pin software versions. Um, upgrades, even minor ones, they can break your cloud in in unexpected ways. And the biggest pain point for us was the upgrade from OSP 11 to 12, um, because this was from non-containerized to containerized uh, uh, services, and I would never skip an update. So even if you can redeploy from scratch, I would actually try the upgrade, because you will learn a lot of things during that. Doing that. Um, containers are also no free lunch. Um, for example, we needed to come up with a container build pipeline, uh, because we had to patch some of the containers, and you know, before containers, you went to the host, you patched the service, uh, the Python um, code, and you were done with it. But with containers, you obviously want to have a container build pipeline. And Triple O, out of the box, gives you a supported out of the box HA uh, OpenStack. And with uh, with common customizations, you are also really well set. But if you have some really exotic uh, customizations. Then it gets a bit uh, more complex because it's such a rigid uh, architecture. It exposes some of the um, uh, customizations, but if they are not exposed, uh, you would have to change a lot of things to get them through through Triple O on your hosts. Um, but Triple O, the upstream project is moving now more towards Ansible. So there's now a new feature where you can basically download the entire Ansible playbook and then run it single tasks of the whole Ansible playbook, so you don't have to run everything when you do an update. Um, flying blind through the clouds is dangerous, so I think having a pipeline for verification and performance regression testing is essential. Um, and uh, infra as a code, really end-to-end, -end is great, but you need to have developer discipline, so you need to do proper um, uh, pull request reviews and also have some kind of release management for tracking those workarounds and fixes. And I will head, um, um, give over to uh, Eric, who will talk about another very important aspect regarding monitoring. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, monitoring. Sometimes I love, sometimes I hate the topic, I guess. Um, monitoring is difficult because it's easy to get wrong, is what I thought. Um, there are several aspects to monitoring that you have to consider for building a monitoring system because eventually monitoring always means some form of alarming or some form of information system. And yes, we are only humans and information is hard to deal with. So some aspects that I came up with that are difficult to deal with is first of all the information the, the monitoring system conveys. You need to bring it at, in at uh, the right time, which means um, of course, you should get an alarm before uh, things go terribly bad, um, and, and you should have some advance warning to be able to actually fix things. Um, to do this, you need to bring this information to the right people. So, um, who can actually do something about the problem? Is the person available? Is it some off hours and you still need to take care of things? So, you need to figure this out if you have some, uh, for example, uh, on-call, Duty. Um, is the mic off? It's the battery. 
Okay. Um, I guess red means low battery. Is it red? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, yes, then of course there is a, a numbers game as well. If you, if you don't get enough alarms, obviously, um, you will oversee uh, <coughs> things and you will miss uh, that certain things are failing or starting to fail. Um, on the other hand, if you get too many alarms, um, you will just be lost in a, in a sea of red lights and you will not really be able to understand what is going wrong. Um, and of course there is something uh, called um, alarming fatigue, which means that if you're exposed to too many alerts, um, you will be less and less concentrated and you will start to more or less ignore any alarms and eventually obviously also miss the, the really important ones. So it's important to get um, the right things to the right people, basically. Um, another thing is that you will probably never build a whole encompassing um, monitoring system on your own. So chances are you're going to rely in, in certain parts on, for example, vendor products, especially if you have, for example, appliances that you bought that often come with their own monitoring um, solutions. And there it is also important to integrate with those because you will not replicate their work, but still you need to get this somehow together. So too many more monitoring systems, if you have to go to three different systems to figure out what is exactly going on, um, you will probably also never get a good overview of things. And the last point, time, from an operational perspective, of course, is too often um, the problem is um, that monitoring is considered an afterthought, so you start building a system and then once you're done you see, okay, it's great, but not always, so we need to do something to figure out when things go bad. Um, I think this is the wrong approach. You must, when you start building a system, um, basically um, continuously um, improve your monitoring with it. Um, <coughs> but as, as any other thing, I guess, uh, monitoring, I would also consider a process rather than a fixed state. Um, so, when we were deploying CLIP, we sat uh, together, obviously, several times, discuss, discussing various things, and monitoring was, of course, among these. Um, and initially, we, or eventually, actually, we, we came up with four main categories of things to monitor or things to watch out for. That is logs, events, status information and metrics. Logs in the, in the most simple case is, I think, just a, a line of text appended to a file. I mean, everybody knows this. Everybody has looked at log files. This is nothing new. But of course, if you look, look at OpenStack, it's a distributed system. So you have several services running on different hosts. Um, so also simple actions will have effect in, if you look at log files, in multiple log files and multiple hosts. So, therefore, um, we need to get this off the host and collect it in a central point where we can have a common view at this. Um, and, of course, there is traditional syslog, which is an absolute mess because it's, aside from, from very few data points, it's completely unstructured, it's, it's, it's just a string, really. Um, but fortunately, with uh, OpenStack, there is a common logging framework there's generally a set of common frameworks. This is this whole Oslo framework. And a part of this is Oslo log, um, which provides us with the ability to extract already structured um, log messages. Um, and the advantage of this is that we get a lot of context information from these OpenStack logs. So, for example, if a resource is created or deleted, or any other changes are being done in the control plane, there is typically some context of who is the user that started this action or what project is this related to or what other resources is this related to. Um, and this, of course, can help a lot of uh, debugging, especially if you think about um, calls going across multiple hosts, multiple systems. Um, events. So if you look at the architecture of OpenStack, um, there is a RabbitMQ message broker through which all the, the services of OpenStack um, publish and consume their RPCs. Um, and additionally to those more or less internal um, service topics, 
there is also a special notification topic on which services can publish high-level event information. This is typically in the, in, in, the, in the level of I'm creating a resource like a volume, I'm starting a virtual machine, I'm creating a new project, I'm deleting a project, things like this. Um, since it's RabbitMQ, it's rather easy to consume because it's a standard uh, messaging protocol. Um, what these events allow us is to track high-level user or operator interaction with the cloud. So, of course, oftentimes you would have the problem, um, for example, a user is trying to, let's say, start a VM on their own, setting up some configuration, and then maybe they say they cannot do as they want, and will tell you, of course, certain things they have tried and they have done, but this might not be exactly what really what they remember might not be exactly what they did. Um, so, in that sense, we have not only, a, a, in a sense, an audit log, but we also can basically trace the, the interaction of users, and this can also help us to see where maybe configurations went wrong. Um, yes, then, of course, not all services publish all the information about themselves uh, on this notification topic. Um, there's also certain things like, is the API up, is the API reachable, is the API um, responding with non-error codes? <coughs> are the certificates for the API still valid? These are things that are typically... Oh, it's battery change time, okay. Thank you. Very good. So power monitoring is also important. Um, okay. Um, so uh, yes, I was at the status checks. So. I mean, a system that you are usually familiar um, that you're usually familiar with is Navios. Um, that is a very old system and follows, I would consider, rather old principles. Um, we decided to go with Senso for this. It's different in a way that it follows a um, publish-subscribe model. So you would, on a central place, the Senso server, you would define certain checks um, and group them in topics. And what clients do is they just subscribe to a topic and they will automatically execute all the checks that are defined for these topics. Which on the one hand makes reconfiguring of uh, checks easy on the server side because it's centrally, you don't have to update anything on the clients. Um, and since your configuration on the client side becomes easier by just having a list of topics that you want to follow, um, the client deployment will also be simplified. And I believe it can get close or even fully automated. Um, what is also another important fact is, uh, since we were at the beginning, we, we talked about um, information overload, um, you need to model certain service dependencies. For example, if you have an HA setup in the control plane, which is three nodes, um, if one node goes down, you will see a lot of services failing for this node, but the actual service availability for the user is still there, and the service itself to the end user is still functioning. So we need to be able to differentiate this and also not be flooded with a, a, a sea of, of alarms. But in that case, it would be important to know the node is down, and yes, obviously, if the node is down, all the services on this node are also down. Okay, and last but not least, um, there are metrics on the hosts. This is, I would consider, mostly performance counters as time series. Um, CollectD is one of the many options that you have to, to collect this information. Um, it's, I think, one of the older tools, but still good. One of the things that it has is this concept of multidimensional um, metrics. So it, it has a concept of a certain metrics and then several instances of this same metric. 
And these instances, or I call them dimensions here, they can change dynamically. So where this is useful is, for example, if we look at the performance counters from libvirt, um, virtual machines that are being added and removed on the host will not require the monitoring system to actually check for a specific VM, but it will just grab all the things um, and you just have more or less dimension depending on what is running on the system. The same, of course, goes with, for example, block devices that might be mapped or unmapped at runtime. Okay, so how do we do this specifically? Um, when, when we were discussing this whole monitoring topic, we also thought it would be good to have one single endpoint or at least one single kind of virtual endpoint that you push all your information to. Um, because it makes it easier to understand and of course um, easier to, to integrate or easier to configure if you have just one, one endpoint where you push your data. Other requirements for this endpoint would be it should be highly available because you don't want one node going down killing basically all the information that you can gather about your infrastructure. And then since we are also at the very beginning, one aspect is as well that it might be able to scale up because if we are not, if we don't have enough resources for this, um, eventually we should be able to, to um, follow the resource demand. So this is why the, the monitoring system is split up in three major components. One part is the interest plane, as I mentioned before, this, this uh, single endpoint. Then there is a data persistence tier where we have the databases that we write the, this information to. And then also for, for our um, side, there are dashboards to actually access this data and visualize it in a way. So we'll uh, step briefly through these um, three parts of the architecture. First of all is the uh, interest plane, as I call it here. Um, this is actually this picture here. What this um, represents here on the very left is um, that we try to basically allow all necessary um, protocols to, to go in there. So what we get here are all the logs, all the collect D metrics, and then also Sensu and those um, relevant queue events from OpenStack um, will end up here. Even though it says RabbitMQ queue here, this is just another RabbitMQ, so this is not the OpenStack control plane, but we are basically um, forwarding the, the messages from the OpenStack control plane onto this RabbitMQ. Um, another aspect, as I said earlier, is that we need to be able to scale up and down, or probably more to scale up. What we have also observed is that there are certain peak times when we get a lot of log messages or a lot of events. Obviously, this is mostly when the control plane is very busy, so this would be phases during um, scale up or scale down of the, the cloud or during deployments of the cloud, where we see a significant increase in, in uh, messages that are coming in. And to be able to handle that kind of situations, um, we have added a buffering layer that should allow us to basically consume messages as fast as they are coming in even though if the, if the persistence end doesn't immediately uh, measure up to this, we gain some time to consume all those messages. Um, yes, then all the, all the logging data and all the structured messages will be stored in Elasticsearch. We use different indexes for this, different um, document uh, schemes. All the uh, time series data or the metrics will be routed to an influx DB. Um, from an architecture point of view, of course, it would be very nice to have just a single layer of, of databases here, but we have tried um, putting the time series in Elasticsearch. Um, what we could see is that we did not find a, a good uh, pattern to store this. It took up a lot of uh, disk space, and in comparison to that, influx DB is so much more efficient. Um, so, for the time being, um, I think this will stay as is. Then, of course, to access those um, databases, we have... Is it? No, I think it's off. Yeah, okay. 
Um, to access those databases, we have um, dashboards. I think. I think. I think uh, Kibana and Grafana are the really well-known um, uh, dashboards. So uh, Kibana, just, just as a brief uh, reminder, Kibana is uh, this um, uh, dashboard that is part of the Elastic stack. So it's made for querying, um, and, uh, querying uh, Elastic search databases and it gives you aggregation views, it, it gives you saved searches that you can reuse. Um, this is, of course, really nice since we have the, the uh, open stack logs, as I said, already structured. We know the subsystems this is coming from. We also have best logs from other parts of the infrastructure. And then we can ask really nice specific questions like, give me all the logs that affected this project um, for, and, and show me the, the logs of the subsystems from, from uh, Neutron, the networking part, and for example, the Nova, the um, virtual compute part. Um, and uh, yeah, with Grafana, this is the typically time series dashboard that you have. Um, uh, this is what we use to query in FlexDB. Again, as mentioned in the very beginning, um, these are already two dashboards. I said everything should be in one single place. How do we deal with this? Again, it's hard. Um, but something that we found is Alerter. This is basically really just your alarming dashboard. It, doesn't really do monitoring in that sense, but it has an API that you push ADOTS to in, in various formats. It's also very easy to integrate. It has a simple plugin system that you can write your own plugins for. Um, and then it will unify al alarms or deduplicate alarms in the sense that it will see, okay, this alarm for this specific resource has been here before, and now its severity, for example, has increased, or it's okay now, and I can remove the alarm for the dashboard. So. Idea-wise, this should be the, the, the single point, the single go-to point, basically, where you would look up your alarms. And this is also the point where we aggregate all the alarms and from where we also send out um, notifications, for example, to our team chat. Um, now, of course, all of this looks nice, but you also have to be able to, to bring this out in a deployment. Um, so, what we try to do is um, to as I mentioned earlier, to have some form of at least semi-automatic um, configuration. Um, for for um, logs, for example, this is rather easy because you would basically say, okay, these are logs coming from a certain environment, like these are logs from the development system, and then all the other information is anyways already there. Um, with other things, um, you may need some, some more tricks to, to get some meta information in there to know what is actually running on the host um, to, to uh, for example, call the right checks. And um, one other thing that we have is an, an in-house application. It's a service catalog that basically um, enumerates all the services that we are running, where we collect documentation and some configuration items. This also lists the service owner. And um, what we do, for example, for the Senso status checks um, is when the client starts that it um, would look up uh, the service owner there, so that if an alarm gets triggered by the system that we know who to send an, a notification to. And also, since not always the ideal person will uh, have a first look at, at an alarm, um, we add some pointers to documentation. So if you see, okay, some service is down, then you get immediately a link to the documentation where maybe previous uh, problems are already documented, or if it's a known problem that gets triggered and we haven't really fixed it yet, that you know how to remediate the situation, how to um, bring it back to normal state. Um, Outlook. So, for the future, when we really go full on cloud, um, I think some things will change. I mean, what is obvious with virtual machines already, um, if you go cloud-native, you, you have this paradigm of uh, 
cattle, not pets, so you just use them as, as workhorses and throw them away again. Um, but this also means that the monitoring has to follow this life cycle, so it needs to be able to come up automatically, uh, also follow maybe scale up and scale down patterns. And if you think further ahead, container orchestration is one of the, the current topics, I believe, then you might also have to consider what happens if your service is not running on a host anymore. So if it's a group of containers, how do you deal with this? Also, how does your monitoring system keep up with this? Does your monitoring system need services to run on a host? Because this is how services are modeled in this, and you need to adapt to those. Uh, further things that we want to look at in the future, but we haven't really gotten there yet. Um, since this is already some, I hope to be compact uh, step for getting all your monitoring information, it would be really nice to have this as your whole infrastructure debugger. Um, one of the big things that we are missing there is uh, tracing. I think this would be nice to have your tracing infrastructure on standby. Um, OpenStack also allows, uh, in a way, to pre-configure your tracing setup, but not trigger it on every API call, for example, except if you add a certain, let's call it a, a shared secret or a secret key um, <coughs> with it, and only then do the actual tracing and send out the tracing information. So this might be interesting for debugging uh, problems in production. Of course, Structured logging from, from OpenStack is nice. As I said, there are also other things that will send you just plain old syslog. There we can still do a lot of um, log parsing and trying to bring these messages to, to actual structured messages. And uh, yeah, we have a call duty um, in our IT department. So some people have to be basically on standby for certain service outages. And I think if we have this fully integrated in monitoring, this would also make sense. Um, of course, there are also online services that would give you kind of this service. Um, but also to make this whole call duty handling as, as hands-off and as hassle-free as possible. And as my very last point, robustness of this deployment is also a topic. Um, Right now, this is set up on a, on a bunch of virtual machines, which is nice as long as your virtual machine infrastructure is running. Um, but there is really a point to bringing this to your kind of last resort um, infrastructure that you can really rely on these things in the most uh, critical situations. And this is also why we have to consider all the time that we must take care of not adding too many external dependencies because, of course, if I rely on an external system for my monitoring, then I can end up in a vicious circle where this external system is down or unreachable and then takes basically the monitoring system with it. This is it also from my part now. I think we are through and we are open to questions. Yes. So, so how many FTE does this take to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we were, yeah, over the last year. So the question was, uh, how many FTEs does it take to make this work? Don't know. We are not there yet. Um, but we have been four people over the last year, basically working on this more or less full time. Yeah. And who are the users of the, the cloud? Is that for the admins? Who are the users of the cloud? So for for of the cloud directly, um, this will be us in the very beginning, um, because our first step will be to bring up a, a classical HPC batch system, SWARM based, and all the usual stuff. Um, for the second half of this year, we hope to open this up uh, step by step to scientific users. Did you, did you integrate first interconnects in your OpenStack? How did you do that? Uh, yeah, we, we did integrate fast uh, interconnects in the sense of uh, we have a 100 gig Ethernet um, network. Uh, in a no, it's a main or Sorry? 
No infinite band or no infinite band. No. I can answer that. So basically, you don't want something that you need because it's just a type similar. So maybe for just the HPC parts of this machine, it will be good enough. But if you're really thinking about making full use of the cloud, you need something that does much more than read that. For example, you really need security stuff. You need you might need network segregation, crypto, things like that. You can run Rocky, right? You can run Yeah. This is run, run Rocky, but only for the HPC parts. But you have other workloads there as well. You might need no balance in cloud volume, deep packet inspection, stuff like that. But this is more an IT infrastructure topic. Yeah, yeah. But you want to have one network that does all of these things. So what we do here is we use an appliance that basically does the whole security enforcement in hardware. So the just a possible quality per second in the software layer. Okay. And you showed different VM colors in your in your slide. What are those? VM colors? Yeah, blue, green, red. Just, just primary colors. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, like you showed three different colors there. So what are these kind of stuff? The different flavors of the VM? Or? For example. Okay. Yes. The whole monitoring stack where it is right now, in terms of the other clouds, or? So it actually runs on a VMware farm with monitors and open cluster. <laughs> yeah. The monitoring is, is this part of the 4FD or do you use it for something else as well? It's, it's part of this 4FD. But I mean, it's really 4FD nominal. I think most of the people were 60 hours per week on this or 50 to 60 ish, something like that. I mean, the, I think the key here is that you need a team that's really you know, cross functional, so you need people from network and storage um, who can design systems like that in the same team. And they should also be able to make decisions and changes to the infrastructure. Otherwise, it would be nearly impossible to apply anything like that. Because also, this digs really deep into your network. And that's actually, actually also what you want. Right? If you don't want this, it's some kind of island somewhere where you just get a couple of these exposed. And will it be worth it? Will it be worth it? Absolutely. But this is really a strategic thing. So, you know, you invest a lot of now, you have something that pays off in say five years or something like that. And this is what I told Damien before. I don't think there is really an alternative to anything like that. I mean if you have another idea how to you know get all the services that the users will use or that they can use publicly um, to get this on uh, working, please tell us how you do it. More questions? Uh, yeah, for the verification and the heat, do you have the YAML published somewhere or not? Uh, or is that for the Yeah, for the heat uh, templates and for the verification. Do you have the, for the OpenStack, do you have are published in somewhere or not? So, so uh, with verification, because the, we have the YAML files for the triple O, that's how the environment looks like, and the verification, so we have and we don't have it publicly, like kind of the Jenkins pipeline to run Tempest and the Ansible playbooks. We haven't published this, but this is there's nothing secret. So eventually, once this is polished, we can also make this available. And last OpenStack summit, actually, there was a lot of interest because I was in this testing and verification uh, special interest group meet meetup, and there were people were asking if anyone is doing actually testing and performance testing, and almost nobody actually said they are doing it. So this is like something which is really lacking. So I think, yeah, eventually we will make them available the playbooks to run Tempest, to run maybe Browbeat, to run those performance tests. Okay. More questions? Yes. Just one thing was not very clear to me, how do you do the scratch file system? The scratch file system? <laughs> yeah. Object storage or so, um, from this market. I don't sure why this diagram are so fuzzy. So basically, we have long term resistance scratches, roughly 10 petabytes of storage here, replicated across the data centers. So here, what you can do is it says here Isilon uh, cluster. So this is what we use for long term resistance storage that's replicated to another data center. 
Der allows multiple people to access it, like an NFS, SMB, and OPEN and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, here again, we have also another storage, which is really used only for infrastructure, so the actual VMs use storage from this, again, replicated HA uh, scale out controller. Um, and for the scratch, what we basically do is we just spin up instances on the NVMe nodes and provide a DJFS file system and so um, the open Skype cluster. Or do some patch system in the, on top of open Skype. Or we can do the same thing with Jeff or with anything else. But for right now, it's EJFS. And this is a shared resource, so you can have this uh, n times in, in the open Skype cluster. So you can use just some of the disabled nodes. <coughs> Anyone else? I have a question. Okay, just one last question. Oh, yeah. Have you tried to run any, any MEP application across the entire cluster to see how it drops the performance? So, what we, need, what we basically did is we looked at um, latency, but only in like, very simple scenarios. Like, what, does this, what does the visualization really cost you? And we clearly see the biggest. Uh, Difference between bare metal and utilization latency. So, it's a problem. So, if you have a pilot, you can push 100 gigabit per second, no problem. Uh, and you don't even need to use RDA, you can just push 100 gigabit per second with TCP easily. But latency is over. So, we haven't really done a thorough benchmark with MPI, yeah, just because MPI work is a lot that relevant for us. Okay. But we kind of check the situation that this is not too hard. So, we may find something that like 50% it's not a machine that has a hundred, it's a lot around a hundred thousand rights. Other questions? I mean, we really only had very, very little time because we many other things aside from the stuff that you mentioned today. And I think we're already happy to talk about the concept and complain about it. Um, so just, you know, yeah. Thanks again.